And so, uh, obviously, we had had a major traumatic event in our country this week that you cannot ignore, even in a sermon, a khutbah, uh, uh, during uh, Jum'ah. <clears throat> and uh, as, as Jum'ah is, is made to remind ourselves about the Day of Judgment, number one, and number two, to address uh, an issue of common concern, an issue involving the affairs of the people, of Muslims. And we as American Muslims cannot ignore what's happening to the rest of society as if we live in a cocoon, as if we live in a ghetto. We live with the rest of people throughout society. So what happens to the nation is happening to us, obviously. And what we saw in terms of the violent insurrection against the U.S. Capitol, which is, there's a name for it, it's called the People's House. And in the great compromise in, in the Constitution, the idea of having the House of Representatives on one side and the Senate on the other side is the compromise between the large states and the tiny states. That the tiny states will have equal power in terms of the Senate, and the large states will have more power in terms of the House. So, in dealing with the situation, you saw tens of thousands of people who felt like they were robbed and they were victims of discrimination. Even though they belonged to the majority of the people, they felt as if they are treated as a minority. And, and, and they felt as white people that there is reverse discrimination against them uh, in the middle class. And we have to understand that there is a demographic, demographic shift in our society. And that demographic shift is basically in terms of numbers. Between 1920 and 1950, we had 80% of the population in the United States was white. And by the way, even at that time, Irish and Italians were not considered white. They were considered non-white because of their Catholic background and not being Protestant. But by 2040 or 2045, in, in around 20 years from now, in two decades from now, whites will represent only less than 50% of the population. So there is that fear that people have that they are losing uh, on what they feel entitled to. So the first problem is this sense of entitlement and this idea of fear. And you have a president who is a demagogue that exploited these fears. Even though the election was over after November 7th or within the week of that, and then the electors according to the Constitution. And it's amazing how people do not read the Constitution. Because all these points are mentioned in this document. And I have my pocket Constitution that I carry with me. And I believe that we Muslims are told to read because we are the people who think. And if more people read the Quran, they would be better Muslims. And if more people read the Constitution, they would be better Americans. And so when we read this uh, Constitution uh, in uh, Article, you know, Article 1, which is basically the, the way that the, the powers are separated, there's the separation of powers between the executive, legislative, and judicial branch. And by the way, there's a U.S. senator that was just elected a football coach who doesn't understand that there are three branches of government. So it's amazing how you have these people now elected to our Senate um, because obviously he has not read the U.S. Constitution or may have read it but didn't understand it. Um, so there was the election and then what we have an electoral college and the electors from each state convened, I think around the first week of December, and they certified the vote. Each state 
has its own way of doing the elections, and each state is given that latitude uh, in terms of how the election is going to be run, and then each state counts their electors, um, and the electoral college basically is made up of uh, the number of House of Representatives plus the two senators, that's your electoral vote for each state. Uh, and so uh, you have each state doing that. And then this week uh, on January 6th, Wednesday, was the time that each state brings their ballots and presents it to the Congress and the, the President of the United States Senate, which, uh, again, according to the Constitution, is the Vice President of the United States, convenes with the Speaker of the House, and they receive the votes from the state, and the President tried to tell the Vice President to stop it from happening, and the President told people that this, the election was rigged and stolen, and, and you, you know all the other details. If not, just uh, Google it. And, and we saw what we saw, what happened. As this Constitution says, the electors shall meet in respective states and vote by ballot for two persons, of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. And they shall, and they shall make a list of all the persons voted for, and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify, and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States, directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and the House of Representatives, open all the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be the president, and then it gives you um, uh, steps to take if there is a tie. So why do I bring up uh, all, all these painful details? It's because people were told something by a wicked opportunist and a group of wicked opportunists who knew better because definitely some of them know the Constitution, but they were duped into doing this. They thought they were in a revolution. They thought they were going to take back their country. But all that they were doing was violent insurrection and violating the law. And we know the double standards uh, that we hear in the news. Finally, the news has caught up to the double standards that if it were a group of black people or a group of Muslims or a group of people of color, uh, obviously uh, the whole situation would have been completely different. So what is our role that I want to end with? Except for those who attain to faith and do righteous work. Coming directly out of the Quran, it means that we are not the ones that are in that chaos like the rest of society is. We are the ones who will rise up. And there are two things that we need to do. Number one, we need to continue our acts of compassion. Compassion is what changes hearts and minds. That is the good work. Amilan salihan. And there's these examples that I want to share with you. The example of Dr. Omar Atik of Arkansas, who lifted the debt of his patients to the amount of $650,000. These are cancer patients. And he told them they owe him nothing. It was a great act of compassion. And maybe something small, although it's a lot of money, but it is small in the, in the broader context of things. That is the kind of compassion that we need. Or in the case of a writer, Elizabeth Gilbert, who is the writer, the, the, the author of Eat, Love, and Pray that was made into a movie, when she was talking to Oprah Winfrey, she told her that she was visiting a small Indonesian island that was very poor, Lombok, and that she was suffering from a divorce, and she was in grave pain, and then one day she got sick, and when she was sick, an Indonesian woman who was very, very poor came and asked about her and they embraced and they cried and Elizabeth Gilbert said that is the face of Islam for me it is these acts of compassion that we must 
exemplify and amplify so that we become more known for what we are and we are those who attain to faith and do good work. Number two, in countering those who are arrogant, and the Quran defines the arrogant as those who blindly stumble to and fro. One of the companions of the Prophet is known to have said, the only time I lost a debate is when I argued with a fool. And we don't argue with fools, we just show our work. But for those who are willing to listen, even if they're on the other side, it is our time to build mutual respect and understanding with those willing to, to listen. And back to the surah, with tini wa zaytun wa turi sinin, wa hadal balad al amin. It is talking about the broader context. It's not just about you or me. It's not just about us. It's about the world. It's about our community. It's about our nation. And we should continue to work for mutual respect, mutual understanding, and in the words of Surah Al-Asr, وَتَوَاصُوا bilhaq, وَتَوَاصُوا bisal, That we find with each other the work together, the two of us, in building the truth and building patience together, both of us, the two parties. That is what I find in the Quran that is inspiring us and <coughs> helping direct us to s resolve some of these social ills, conflicts, and issues that we're going to be dealing with for at least the next 20 years or so. Oh Allah, thank you for bringing us on this Jummah. And thank you for the Islamic Center that has provided us this connection and this service and this platform so that we can help each other in becoming better Muslims and better Americans and better people of faith and better citizens. Our country needs us more now than ever. Give us the opportunity, inshallah, that we may show what Islam is about. O oh Allah, give our youth the pride and the clarity to find Islam and serve Islam for the future of our country. O oh Allah, let us be among those who are the righteous, among those who speak the truth, among those who strive in your cause, willing to sacrifice for your cause, inshallah. Wa akhir da'wana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa akum as-salam.